I want to talk to you today about something you already know a lot about. But I want to work at reframing it for all of us. We have grown up in a period of time when we think of screens as potential danger, but also potential fun. We think of them, even the way we talk about them, we talk about the Bluetooth and the idiot box. Um, and we have grown up in a whole period where there's been this dichotomy between freedom of expression and child develop, development and child protection as if it, they were opposites of each other, as if they were adversaries. And in fact, that's what's played out in places like the US Congress. What I'd like to do is step away from that values-based way of looking at it and reframing it as an issue of public health, an issue of how we are changed and that it is not about are we changed or are we not changed. We all know we're changed. Even the people who tell us that their media does not change us are but at the same time telling press toothpaste that media will change their customer base. So let's start. What is happening here? Are they learning or are they falling behind? No matter how many screens there are in our lives, research is done every five years has revealed that still television is the most used screen in our kids' lives. Essentially 100% of homes have televisions in them. Even homes without running water have televisions in them. I don't think that's a surprise to you. But there were some surprising data in our most recent look at this. More homes in America have seven or more TVs than have one TV. 45% say the TV is on all or most of the time that people are at home and awake. 63% have it on during meals. And 75% of children in the first year of life watch TV or DVDs for almost two hours on average every day, as opposed to 23 minutes of being read to. So why are kids using screens? Parents believe that children need media early and often to be able to compete in the world of the future, that they need to get in front of screens. Now, the only problem with that thinking is what about the screens today relates to what the screens will be like 20 years from now? The iPad is only four years old, and look at how completely it's transformed not only the market, but the way we live our lives. 32% of parents believe TV helps their children, 34% believe it harms their children, and 33% believe it makes no difference. That's a pretty even split. But the really interesting thing about it is there is no relationship between their beliefs about how media work on their kids and what their expectations and rules are in their homes. So just as many parents who think TV hurts their kids let their kids watch as much TV as those who believe it helps their kids. And only 6% of parents know that there even are pediatric recommendations around screen use, let alone what they are. So how many of you have seen this? Proud parent brings out the iPad, puts it in front of their 18-month-old and said, look how smart my kid is. He can make the cow go moo. Guess what? Every 18-month-old can do it. This proves how smart Steve Jobs was. This is the most transparent interface that's ever been developed between a thinking machine and a human being. 10% of kids use a smartphone or a tablet at the age of one now, and that's numbers going up daily. What research over the last 30 years has shown is that no significant learning occurs from the screen under the age of about 30 months that kids will begin to mimic things they see on screen, but they do not retain it. And there's also something called the video deficit, which is if you take, for example, you show a kid how to put on a mitten in real life, it takes six times demonstrating that on screen before they can get it. So there is, it's an attenuated effect when you put it on a screen. The American Academy of Pediatrics discourages screen media under the age of two not because it's toxic to them, but because it doesn't help them. And it is not a good, as good a use of their time as something else, as stacking blocks or interacting with other people. Why is this? 
Well, one of the reasons we end up with the most complex and sophisticated brain in the animal kingdom is that we are born with embryonic brains. Every other organ system is a functional version of itself at birth except the brain. Think about it. Human infants are completely helpless. They can't get warm, they can't find food. They can't survive without a caring adult. Other animals can. But what that means is that we get to build our brain in response to the environment in which it's going to function. The demand of that environment forms those synaptic connections that allow us to function in the world. And that gives us the resilience, the creativity, and the ability to deal with stress in much more complex ways than animals. The other thing that happens in the first two years of life is not only is the brain tripling in volume and making billions of synaptic connections, but it's also pruning away huge amounts of the brain to improve our signal to noise ratio. Remember, a newborn baby is all startled. Every sound, everything they more or look like do. And they, over time, learn to discern that that shape of light and dark is mom's face, or that that smell is milk. And that is because of what they prune away. So use reinforces, disuse prunes away. What does the growing infant brain need? Face-to-face -face interaction with other human beings. Acting on their physical environment, stacking up those blocks, getting that Cheerio into their mouth. And free play, creative problem-solving play. Herein lies the problem. Screens don't give you any of those things. Even the best of the educational software is basically skills and drills. This is an A, et cetera. Babies can't relate to that. What they relate to is mommy smiling, mommy singing, daddy reading a book. So one of the studies we did early on is looked at babies and how they could learn from TV, and that was because this was the number one baby shower gift in the US. <laughs> baby Einstein. Has anybody ever seen a Baby Einstein DVD? Can you imagine Einstein actually watching that? <laughs> but even its name argues that you will have a child who wins a Nobel Prize if you put your child in front of this. So we actually looked at this. This was all uh, published in pediatrics and got a lot of press in the big world. And we looked at 700 babies from birth to age three. Looked at their screen media use and looked at their visual and verbal IQs at age three. And when you looked at the raw data, the kids who had more screen time had lower IQs. But when you looked at other aspects that we know affect kids' IQs, like mother in, in, in the, breastfeeding, breastfeeding, or parents in the house, um, reading to the child, etc., the independent effect of screens disappeared. So what we think we are seeing here is that Television or screen use may be a marker for parental attention. It may not be an independently toxic thing so much as a, you know, a way to say, hey, you know what, you're putting your kid in front of the screen instead of talking to him or, or reading to him. So once they get to 30 months, what are they learning? Well, we now have a generation of experience with Sesame Street. And what we are seeing is that when Sesame Street is watched at ages three to five, which is the age it's designed for, those kids are more ready for school, they have more pre-reading and pre-math skills, and most robustly, they are more pro-social. They are expecting a more diverse, tolerant world. And when you go back to those kids as high school seniors, the same kids are less aggressive, place more value on achievement, they read more, they have higher grades, and they're more creative than those kids who are watching entertainment television. But they're not all watching Sesame Street. And what I'm gonna show you is a little experiment done by a colleague of ours in Minnesota, putting preschool kids in front of the two most popular shows of the time. We took our cameras to a local daycare site, hid the cameras, and filmed the kids watching current shows of Barney, and then Power Rangers. The kids reacted to Barney with...
was especially enjoying the show. Watch how the kids interact once the show is over. They use the maracas to make music. After watching the Power Rangers, the change was immediate and overwhelming. While some kids exploded, others were transfixed, clearly identifying with different characters. The Power Ranger message of beating someone up for a good cause was lost. The group disintegrated. Remember, here are the kids with Barney. What else do I see? Here are the kids with Power Rangers. had been instruments after Barney were now weapons. Now, I know most of your parents of adolescents and maybe parents of younger kids too, but these are going to be adolescents very soon. And one of the reasons I show this, even to parents of adolescent audiences, is that kids of this age don't know manners yet, and so they really show their response immediately. But the reality is we all respond to the content of media. The best studied area of the effects of media content on all of us is violence. Violence has been concerned since the early 1950s when they were worried about the effects of gun smoke on juvenile delinquency. So it's been studied for over half a century now. And what we see over and over again is one or more of three responses in those who use more violent media than those who use less. The first is an increase in fear and anxiety, particularly in younger children, but in all of us. I had a 14-year-old patient who used to walk the dog at night until he started playing Call of Duty, and then he was too frightened to go out at night because he was expecting someone to jump out from every bush that he went past as he walked around his neighborhood. We're all desensitized. We are an adaptable organism. You put us up to high altitude, we're gonna make more red blood cells. You put us in a violent environment, we're going to get inured to it. We're going to not care about it as much. And finally, and this is the area that people are most concerned about, but interestingly, this is the least prevalent response to violent media. Some kids, and we don't know who they are in advance, have increased aggressive thoughts and behaviors. Now, as tragic as school shootings are, they're actually very rare events. But there are events happening every day in virtually every community that this also speaks to, and that is bullying. One of the things we know from the bullying research is that three components are needed for bullying to occur in a group, a school, or a community. The first is you need a bully, you need a victim, and you need bystanders. You need people who let it go on who sometimes cheer and encourage, in part because they don't want to be the next victim. But look at how those three map onto the three outcomes we see time and again from using violent media. So the question is, are we entertaining our children to expect a world like this and to recreate a world like this when we put them in front of Grand Theft Auto or a violent movie? So how real is this? One of the things we can do in public health research is we can look at the relative strength of correlations. How often when this occurs does this occur? And we can compare it to other things that we know. So this is the relative strength of the relationship between calcium intake and bone mass. Drink your milk, build strong bones. Between passive smoke and lung cancer. Between lead exposure and lower IQ. Between not using a condom and becoming infected with HIV. These four things are things that we as clinicians and all of us as citizens basically deal with as fact. And yet this is the relationship between exposure to media violence and the least prevalent of those three responses, which is increased aggression. And we have yet to address this as a public health issue. And we see changes in the brain. I won't explain all of this to you, but basically when we do functional MRI and show kids everything from uh, neutral scenes to violent scenes. There are unique areas of the brain that fire off. These areas are areas associated with fight or flight, with 
getting ready to move. And interestingly, the same area of the brain that lights up when PTSD sufferers are asked to relive their traumas, their, their battle fatigue, et cetera, in the tube. So what we think we're seeing is the neurobiological basis for what we see behaviorally, which is that the more exposure we have the more, to violence, the more likely we are to go in that direction, to accept the world like that, and to not step in when another child is being bullied in the playground or online. And it's not just violence that's learned. Smoking, this is Natalie Portman in her very first movie at age 11. Um, and this, this is a, a movie in which a professional hitman does all kinds of mayhem and then comes back and tries to convince an 11 year old to get it together and stop smoking. So one of the things that's interesting we see is that it does not matter whether it's a good guy or a bad guy that smokes. It does not even matter if there's an anti-smoking message. When we see people we look up to, people we glamorize smoking cigarettes, Kids are 2.6 times more likely to start smoking and 2.2 times more likely to develop a smoking habit because that's what they aspire to. The same thing happens when the average adolescent confronts the average model selling her clothes. These are what are called thinspiration sites or proanocytes where anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa are put forth as choices, lifestyle choices, political statements, not as illness, and they compete with each other online for how much weight they can lose. And sex, the bane of every adolescent parent's existence. I love this as a teen magazine cover story, let's talk about sex, make your school sex education stimulating. What does that mean? <laughs> One of the things that we know, though, is we've looked at kids who've been exposed to more sexual references, and I'm not talking about porn, I'm talking about things like Friends, shows that deal with sex and sexuality as a plot line. Those kids who are exposed to it earlier, who become sexually active two years earlier on average than kids who are exposed to less of it when you look at what they watch and, and divide it into you know, percentage of the material they see. In addition, what we're seeing is that kids who listen to music with sexually degrading misogynistic lyrics are twice as likely to initiate sexual activity in the next two years and to advance more quickly in their sexual behaviors. So from all of this, what we take is that it's not just Sesame Street or Baby Einstein, it's all media are educational. The difference is what they teach and how well they teach it. They are learning as much from Call of Duty as they are from a PBS series. <laughs> what we feed a child's mind is as important as what we feed a child's body. We can walk down the aisle of any supermarket and pick up anything and read on the label exactly what we're putting in our kids' body, the sodium, the, the cholesterol, et cetera. We have no idea what we're putting into our kids' minds because the rating systems are not there to protect your child. They are not there to protect you. They are there to protect the media producers from being censored. And they were, the movie ratings were the first introduced in 1968 to get rid of the Hays Code, the censorship, the government oversight. But one of the things that our research has shown is that the movie ratings shift one full rating point every 11 years. So what was PG 11 years ago is PG, what was PG 13 11 years ago, it's PG. What was R is PG 13, et cetera. How about the online world? Is she connecting or is she at risk? One of the things we have to realize about this world that is very scary to a lot of us digital immigrants is how the digital natives take to this. And one of the things we have to realize is how important it is to them and their developmental stage. Media are a very fertile environment for adolescent development. Think about what's going on in their heads. They're able to do abstract thinking. Social justice becomes all important. They're hugging trees and saving whales. 
The entire Occupy movement started as a tweet in British Columbia. And you know, you ask people what it was about, and everybody had a different answer. What, what the Occupy movement was. But the fact is that social media is incredibly good for bringing people together of like interests, whatever that might be. They seek experience. This is a still from a video game, not one that you can buy in the stores, but one that you can get for free at your US Army recruiter. They seek independence. I was skiing last winter went and saw this whole table of a family getting together, extended cousins, etc., and two 11-year-olds were busy texting away. And I finally asked, so who are you texting? Each other, right? They're all sitting at the same table, but they're seeking independence from mom and dad's oversight. They are establishing their identity. One of the wonderful things that the internet does is it allows kids who have traditionally felt isolated, different, and have been bullied and picked on to find a community to connect with others, to understand that they are okay and that it will be okay. Um, the It Gets Better movement is a great example of that. And they seek connection. This is now the third largest nation on earth. More than a billion people go on Facebook every month. That's bigger than anything but China or India. So how are they using their time? Well, those data we collected in 2010, we looked at the average use of time. And when you look at the 24-hour day as a pie chart, it looks pretty well balanced until you break it down by type of activity and you realize what a huge chunk of the day kids are spending with media. They use media on average, or in 2010, they used media on average for seven hours and 38 minutes of every day. And because we started collecting these data in 1999, we, cell phones weren't what they are now or what they were in 2010. This doesn't count the half an hour of talking, an hour and a half of texting that we're doing. And they're not sitting on the couch watching TV. They are using media like this, multitasking 28 to 29% of the time so that they are in fact exposed to 10 hours and 45 minutes of actual content in that seven hours and 38 minute average. I've got to update this slide because I did this slide to a bunch of kids, fifth graders, and someone raised her hand and said, what's that curly thing going across the room? <laughs> so one of the things we can do is learn from history. Let's go back 100 years. Let's go back a century and look at the things that caused morbidity and mortality in kids that got them sick and killed them. Leading causes of death were infectious disease, birth defects, and cancer. Things that we physicians could do nothing about. We didn't even have antibiotics, let alone understand the human genome. But when we looked at the environments in which they were living, and we realized that they were crowded, they were dirty, they were full of toxic waste, and we took environmental measures to clean them up, those disease rates went down dramatically. Today, the leading causes of death in the outside the birth period are injury, homicide, and suicide, up until they're about 30. Not only that, but during this period of time is when they get started on long-term morbidities like obesity, substance use, risk-taking of various kinds. These are very different than what was happening a century ago. These are acquired health risk behaviors. So where do they acquire them? Well, ask the kids. National survey after national survey, when we asked them where they learned about relationships, about sex, about nutrition, they cite entertainment media as their first or second most important source of information. Apologies to the educators in the room and apologies to the parents in the room, but they are listening more to what they're seeing on TV or on websites or in social media than they are to us. So maybe instead of thinking of these devices as independent vectors of good or evil, education or harm, let's think about them as the environment in which they're living. Look at how much time they're spending them, with them. This is like the air they breathe and the water they drink. And let's think about it in terms of how can we change that environment, 
not so that they're not using them, but so that they're using them wisely and mindfully and using them in ways that make them more what they want to be. So can there be too much media time? We've known for a couple of decades now that there's a dose-response relationship between hours of television watching and obesity. But there are also more subtle things going on. When we looked at those kids in 2010, and we divided them by into thirds as to how much screen time, cumulative screen time they had, the first thing that jumped out at us was where those one-third breaks are. The light users were three hours or less a day. The heavy users were 16 hours or more a day. These are thirds. We asked them three questions, and we compared the light users to the heavy users. We asked them, do you have A's and B's or C's and below? Do you get in trouble a lot? And how contented are you? And what was interesting was that the heavy users had twice the rate of negative outcomes as the light users. Now, I don't think this is causal, but it may be a marker for a whole host of things. In other words, I don't think that the kid who sits in front of the TV all the time is being made depressed or you know, unable to relate to others by being in front of the TV. It may be he's in front of the TV because he's depressed and unable to relate to others. And so there may be a cyclic relationship here. And I am seeing more and more kids with the chief complaint of falling asleep in school or can't remember what I did yesterday in school, what I learned yesterday. And when you ask them, more and more of them are sleeping like this. Cell phone, on stun, on vibrate, under the pillow, or on the bedside stand. And when you ask them why they do it, they say, oh, that's my alarm clock. Like, like you can't go to Walmart and buy a five dollar alarm clock. What they're doing is they're staying up late texting each other, but more importantly, they're waiting for that text to come in at three in the morning so that their best friend can say WTF to them, right? So they're not getting good quality sleep. Not only less sleep, but poor quality sleep. And the problem is, is that you don't, when you don't get that deep REM sleep, you don't move what you learn from your short-term memory into your learning centers. And so, even if you're awake in algebra class today, you may not remember what happened in algebra class yesterday because you haven't found that natural consolidation of experience that happens when you have stage four deep REM sleep. They are always online. And what is happening online? Well, we went back to the kids, and you know how your kid always has the English paper open on the computer when you walk by, always. There may be a window or two open behind it, just as a, as a thought. When we ask them how they're spending the time, remember this is all anonymous for them, so they can tell us the truth. The average of homework time is 16 minutes online. Video and music downloading, a little over an hour. And social media and games, about an hour and a half. 42% of 10 to 17-year-olds say they've ended up on a porn site. 4% have been asked for a sexual picture of themselves by someone they don't know. Now, 4% sounds like a tiny number until you realize that's one kid in every classroom, ages 10 to 17. Cyberbullying, which is the use of the electronic media to harass, coerce, ostracize, bully, you know, threaten, uh, you know, it's different between boys and girls. Girls do psychological warfare, boys do physical warfare. So boys are saying, I'm gonna beat you up. Girls are saying, you're a slut, you're ugly, you're stupid. Um, you're not talking to anybody. And I actually had a patient who left school one day, everything was fine, walked into school the next day, and no one would talk to her, and she was hearing slut under their breaths, because overnight, uh, an instant messaging string had gone around making up total garbage about her and she was completely ostracized in the space of an overnight. I'm sorry, cyberbullying in high school is 21% of females and 8.5% of males. Um, this is more of a girl thing. This is the psychological warfare thing. But when you go down to the younger ages, 42% of fourth to eighth graders say they've been victims of cyberbullying. And an interesting thing about these data, when you look at them, 58% say they've received and 53% say they have sent. 
messages online that are hurtful. This is very different than old-fashioned bullying in the playground where the big guy gave wedges to the little guy or the cool girls were mean to the uncool girls. What's happening is because the power differential is less clear online, is that many kids who are bullied turn around and bully others or bully the same people and try to develop a viral wave of turning against somebody. And most sadly, perhaps 58% say they have not revealed their involvement to an adult. Not because they don't think we care, but because they think we are so utterly clueless about that environment that what are we going to do when we find out our child has been cyberbullied? Take away their device. Take away their Facebook page. This is the last thing they want because they see it as the way of defending themselves, as the way of establishing themselves in the world. And finally, why are they spending so much time online? Um, a global experiment was done um, about a year ago with 1,000 college students in 10 countries, five continents, and they were asked to turn off all their electronics for 24 hours. I literally did not know what to do with myself from the UK. I didn't use my cell phone. I can't live without me from Chile. I felt lonely as if I was in a small cage in an island. It's like a haiku from China. <laughs> Sometimes I felt dead from Argentina. Media is my drug. Without it, I was lost. I am an addict. I was itching like a crackhead because I could not use my phone from the good old US of A. What's interesting is this is globalization, not of economics, but of culture. We have become so hooked to these devices and so in need of them. So is there such a thing as an addiction disorder? Can you be addicted to these? You probably have known or worried that some of these symptoms of addiction to anything are see, being seen in your or other kids in your lives. Excessive use, increasing tolerance, needing faster computers, bigger screens, better sound, more software, the latest version of, and withdrawal symptoms. When they're away from it, they get irritable, they can't, can't you know, contain themselves, they need to get back, and then they're better once they get in front of it again, and they're willing to take on negative consequences. Korea, which recognizes this as a disorder, has quarter of a million kids under 18 in active treatment for internet addiction disorder, and they think that that's about one-tenth of the ones who suffer from it. In this country, those who meet Korean criteria for internet addiction disorder are more obsessive compulsive, more depressed, more anxious, more hostile, more paranoid, and have lower interpersonal sensitivity than those kids who do not. Interestingly, there's a much higher prevalence of addictive relationships with electronics in kids who have ADD. In part because it's an easy to manage environment for them and it's, they feel more mastery there. Interestingly, their symptoms subside with gameplay and those who suffer from addictive relationships get better when you give them Ritalin, the most commonly used ADD drug, even if they don't have ADD. And yet this is not a recognized diagnosis in the United States. Nevertheless, I get one to two new referrals every week to me for exactly this complaint. My kids staying out of school, playing video games, my kids online all the time, whatever. So let's go back to those kids who are kept off for 24 hours, two weeks later. It was unpleasant to realize how distracted I was. When you really get off the media, you realize how many quality things you can I interacted with my parents more than usual. Imagine that. And I've lived with my best friends for three years. This is the best day we've spent together. So they can realize how hooked they are, and they can step away from it. And in fact, one of the things I'm recommending now to all of the kids I care for, whether they are struggling with this or not, is that they think about the family having a digital Sabbath. One day a week, Everything is off, and they look at me like I'm absolutely crazy. I can't believe this. You know, and it's often the parents as much as the kids who are saying. But the ones that have tried have come back and said, it's phenomenal. You went for a walk. I held my wife's hand for the first time in 20 years. <laughs> you know, we, we took the kids outside. We went to the zoo. We did things. We threw a football around the backyard. All these
these things that we have sort of moved away from that they were a rediscovery? And what's happening to the kids' brains? Well, interestingly, we can use that MRI machine to look at kids' brains, at all of our brains, when we do things. We now can map the brain based on what happens when we tap our fingers together, what lights up on the, in the brain, or when we look at you know, a, a color, or when we sing a song. Interestingly, these little discrete areas show exactly what tracks are being used. And as with all research, there's downtime in between them. So you set up the next situation, and you're going to do it. And someone turned on the fMRI, the MRI tube in between, and discovered that when someone's mind is wandering, when they're staring at beige plastic six inches from their face, a whole diverse network lights up in our brain. And of course, in our infinite wisdom, our first response was, we're going to call this the default mode method. This is the brain doing nothing. But someone said, let's talk, let's ask people what was going on there. And they say things like, well, the last thing you showed me was the color red. And that reminded me of tomatoes in the garden I have to pick. And oh man, they're past their time, but maybe I'll make tomato sauce with them the way grandma used to make. And grandma died last year, and that makes me feel kind of sad, but I met a second cousin I never knew at the funeral. When our mind is wandering, it is moving from thought to sensation to memory to idea, like a butterfly moving from flower to flower. And there are those who are now working on this idea of the so-called default mode network as where we build the template we call the self, that unique fingerprint of experience and sensation and idea and philosophy that is only ours and no one else's in the world. There are others who are looking at this as the seat of creativity. That if you think about it, that's where you go out and gather these diverse things and pull them together and put them together in new ways. Like when Picasso went into the landfill and found a bicycle seat and a pair of handlebars and turned them into a sculpture of a bull's head. And so one of the things that's very interesting is we've been measuring IQ since the late 1800s. Every generation, our IQ goes up, our collective IQ goes up by about 10 points. It's something called the Flynn effect. And what we're measuring when we measure IQ is how well we access information and put it together. Well, there are other kinds of intelligence, such as creativity. And there is a CQ, a creativity quotient that has been measured since the 1950s, and it has gone steadily downward in the population since the 1950s. So one of the things that that brings to mind is, are we actually, by stimulating ourselves all the time, denying ourselves the ability to let our default mode network work, to build ourselves, to build our creativity? And again, to go back to history, about 100 years ago, there was a very bored patent officer in Switzerland. He used to walk to work beside the river, look at the eddies in the water, and go and stamp a bunch of meaningless papers and go back home and walk upstairs and write up a little thing called the theory of relativity. Late in his life, when Einstein was asked, how did you do this? How did you come together with this incredible theory that no one can disprove, it all hangs together so beautifully? He said, it's because I was bored. We are so afraid of boredom that we are stimulating our kids every second of every day, and we're not giving them the chance to be bored. In boredom, there may be freedom. So, um, to wrap this up, I want to offer to you the resources of the Center on Media and Child Health. Um, we are dedicated to educating and empowering children and those who care for them to optimize their use and creation of media. And we do three things. We investigate, we do the research, we translate that research, and we innovate. With them. And I'm only going to talk to you about the translation piece. What do we do with the translation? The first thing we do is we empower those guys, the digital natives, because they've been using these tools since they were born. <laughs> How do we do this? Well, this, I'm gonna show you a, pros, a project briefly of what we did with public school kids in Vermont. Hey, media. Were you to tell me how to be? Models look like this, but I don't. I am who I am, and how can be influenced to be something that I'm not? I'm gonna be myself, I'm perfect just the way I am. This is how I look. I'm not digitally or computer 
that research into parenting and teaching skills and educating us the digital immigrants. And that's a resource that's available to you all. I have, I have um, access cards if you want them um, afterwards. Um, but I would encourage you to come to our website. Um, it has a lot of resources available um, at cmch.tv that's on the cards um, if you want them. Um, we have tip sheets for parents for various age groups at, at, at the website um, that can be printed out if you're a teacher or if you're in a situation where you can provide information to others. They're available for free. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, um, we have an online advice column called Ask the Mediatrician, in which I've gotten um, every question from at what age should I introduce a cell phone to my kid to how do I get my son to quit singing Viva Viagra in the supermarket. Um, <laughs> And we try to answer all of these questions, regardless of what they are, into questions that are based in the research that exists. Um, we acknowledge when we don't know and what we need to learn more about. It is balanced. That doesn't say that's bad, you shouldn't do that, you're a bad parent or your kid's a bad kid, but more to say, here are the good things, here are the things to be concerned about, here's how to fix them in a very practical way. And that's available also through our website or directly from Ask the Mediatrician. Um, and we also have a lot of resources for blogs, to parenting, e-newsletters, to Twitter, to Facebook, and we just started an Instagram page, and it's one of our first images is of um, a walking lane for people who are texting in China. Yeah, I don't know if anybody saw that, but it's a brand new thing. It's peed on the sidewalk, like if you're texting, hey, you know, walk here, you know, and you actually want to get something and walk over there. So let's think about really quickly how to translate this into practical use. Let's take something that freaks societies, communities, and parents out, sexting. Let's think about what happens. 13-year-old girl falls in love with the man she will love till the day she dies. Right? It always happens that way. That's what Romeo and Juliet said. So what does she do? She shows her eternal love by flashing it and sending a private image to him on the phone. And by the time he gets it, he's all over her. He's thinking that that other girl in the third row in math class, and so he shares it with his best buddy or a couple of his best buddies who share it with a couple of best buddies. And by the time she gets back to school tomorrow, she's the slut. And what do we as communities do? We arrest them. Kids who, including the girl who sent that picture, are guilty of a class C felony, child pornography. It is against the law, so we arrest them, and in some states, we make them registered sex offenders. Um, so let's think about how we can approach it from a developmental and science-based approach. Same exact thing. We have kids who are at the peak of their sexual urges and curiosity and cluelessness. They are incredibly expert with the media tools. They are surrounded by clueless us, and they have no prefrontal cortex yet. They're not going to get one for another 10 years. This is the reason why you can't rent a car till you're 25, because actuarially you can't make the smart decisions of them. <laughs> and you certainly can't do impulse control, future thinking, what we used to call the superego or the conscience. We have the perfect storm here, but this is human behavior as it existed since we crawled out of the caves in a whole new environment. We have to understand that environment and use it properly. So to wrap it up, what matters? What are the things you can remember? 
The message in the media, your kids, and you are using matters. The environment in which it is seen matters. It is very different for your kid to stumble on, you know, uh, a, a sex-related website with you there to help them construct, understand, process it, than in the back room where no one's around or with their buddies or whatever. The developmental stage of the child matters. It is very different when Call of Duty is played by a 20-year-old and a 12-year-old. The information that you bring to this matters. If you are a mindful, aware media user, if you are a parent who parents in the digital space, which we all have to do, and we've made the mistake of sort of checking out because we are so technologically inept thanks to our kids, that we don't want to sit down next to them and play those video games because our thumbs just don't move like that. But we have to because that's where they are. And we have to bring our parenting skills and our prefrontal cortex cortexes into play to help them learn to be good digital citizens. And finally, the amount does matter. Remember, this is the most important function of your device. And remember, and with all apologies to Allen Ginsberg, I will close by pushing it and seeing what comes. I saw the best minds of my generation distracted by texting, emailing, tweeting, dragging their cursors through Google links at dawn, looking for an info fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ultra-fast heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night, who wired and networked and hollow-eyed and caffeinated sat up searching in the imaginary comfort of Facebook friends, floating across the tops of cities, contemplating signals, who bared their brains to GPS under satellites and saw Wikipedian angels editing on collective knowledge illuminated, who passed through Wi-Fi hotspots with radiant Bluetooth earphones, hallucinating avatars in low-res Second Life islands among the gamers of Warcraft, who were expelled from chat rooms with dreams, with wireless nightmares, megapixels, alcohol, YouTube, and endless eyeballs, who connected via instant messaging in underwear, burning their money on eBay impulse purchases, tapping into the zeitgeist through the synapses of Twitter, who jacked in continuously 70 hours from Pandora to iPod to Amazon to Flickr to Boing Boing, yakety yakking, primal screaming, unblinking, participating. Unplug! 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 I'm with you in the compulsion to check inboxes, news feeds, and Facebook. Unplug! I'm with you in the addiction and longing for focus. Unplug! I'm with you to cut the umbilical cord of data. Unplug! I'm with you to disconnect from the infosphere. Unplug! I'm with you to power down and revisit the present tense. By the way, if you're in your smartphone phone at that, that will connect you right into our website.